Hi, I'm Dr. Laura Wilson, and thank you for joining us for A New Way to Museum. So as paleontologists, we're kind of like detectives, and we have a very spotty system of clues that we have to look for to be able to put together the life history of an extinct organism. One of the things that we do is in a, this subfield called functional, functional morphology. So one of the things that we have to do is in the subfield called functional morphology, and it's relating form to function. So how the size, the shape, or the arrangement of different skeletal elements of an organism relate to how that animal or that plant functioned, moved, lived its life within the ecosystem. So one of my favorite examples that we have is here in the chalk bed galleries at the Sternberg Museum of Natural History, and it's using some of our marine reptiles. So back in the Cretaceous, 80 to 100 million years ago, we didn't have big marine mammals like whales and dolphins or seals and sea lions playing roles of top predators. We had marine reptiles. So these were lizards and other types of reptiles that actually had originally evolved on land and then transitioned back into the water and secondarily had aquatic or, or living their entire lives within the water. So they have special adaptations for swimming around in ocean ecosystems. So one of our examples here is Tylosaurus. So Tylosaurus is a big mosasaur, which is a type of squamate lizard, so somewhere related to either monitor lizards or um, snakes. And so we can actually look at the anatomy, so look at the size and the shape of the different bones making up this animal, and start to get an idea of how it moved and how it functioned in the ecosystem. So kind of starting at the snout and moving to the tail, we can look at things like the shoulder girdles, so where the arms attach to the rest of the body, as well as the pelvic girdles. And though we see these big hands that are very crocodilian-like, even though these, these are not um, crocodiles are closely related to them, what we see is that their shoulders and their hips are actually kind of small. We don't have these huge bones that are going to be supporting weight. So we know that these animals probably weren't spending any time or very little time crawling around on land, but we also know that they probably weren't using their limbs to help propel them, to help them swim. But if we pan down the rest of the body, we start seeing how these animals swam. And so this is a 30 foot long mosasaur and half of the body is tail. So Tylosaurus has this big long tail um, that with these uh, vertebrae on them the backbone that are tall, so lots of big muscles um, that's going to make this, this long fin um, of this tail to swim and undulate through the water. So we can look at the anatomy um, and the bone structures of Tylosaurus and other mosasaurs and understand that they're actually going to be moving through the water with this long powerful tail, again similar to how a crocodilian or our water monitors swim through the water, um, rather than, than using their, their limbs for propulsion. This is very different than what we see in another type of marine reptile called plesiosaurs. So we have a Dolly Carinkops plesiosaurs, a short-necked plesiosaur that lived in, this, in similar marine ecosystems, similar marine environments to our mosasaurs, but moved very differently. So if we look at their anatomy and their functional morphology, we don't see these big long tails that we have in mosasaurs, so they're probably not tail swimmers. Rather, we see these elongate hands and feet with all of these different finger bones. This is this really cool phenomenon called hyperphalange, where they actually add additional finger bones, so they're making paddles. And these paddles, their arms and their feet are, have very strong attachments through their shoulders and their hips to the rest of the body. So these animals, like Dalekarinkops, was probably using its, its feet and its hands in these paddles to swim through the water, maybe similar to how a sea turtle does to some degree today. So this is just one really cool example that we have um, from fossils that we find in western Kansas for how we can look at the clues left behind in the fossils, the shapes and the size of the bones, how they 
they fit together to make up these animals, and then what that tells us about how these animals lived their lives, how they moved, how they swam, and how they fit into their ecosystems. So one of the cool things that we get to do with, with paleontology, putting together these mysteries and trying to figure out who did what and how they do it just by you know the, the bones that are left behind. Um, but really cool things that we get to do every, th every day when we're studying fossils. Um, if you like this video, be sure to click the like button, follow us on um, social media, leave any comments or questions that you may have, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks for joining us in A New Way to Museum with the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. If you enjoyed this video, like it and subscribe to our channel. Hit the bell for notifications when we release a new video. Support us on Patreon for early access and exclusive content. You can also follow us on all our social media. Links are found in the description. Thanks for watching, and follow your curiosity to new discoveries.